Devotion is a movie that tells a story of the first black naval aviator, Jesse Brown, and his wingman, Tom Hutner. How historically accurate is it? In this second episode of the series, we ask ourselves, did Jesse Brown actually go on a raid against the Yalu Bridges? Stay tuned as we look in depth in the real Yalu Bridge missions. A forewarning, there are spoilers ahead. If you haven't seen the movie, go watch it and come back here for an analysis of Jesse and Tom and the truth about the real Yalu Bridge missions. One scene in the movie depicts Jesse making a run on the bridge spanning the Yalu River. He disobeys Tom's orders and tries to use his remaining rockets on the highway bridge because the second flight of Sky Raiders have to pull back from too much AA. As he approaches the bridge under fire, he launches his rockets and hits a portion of the highway bridge. He manages to bring down two spans of the bridge. Did this happen? How accurate is this really? The following is a retelling of what actually took place. Let's start with some background. On June 25, 1950, the North Korean army crossed the border into South Korea and started the Korean War. Caught off guard, the United States and allied nations began operations soon afterward in support of South Korea. The U.S. military was hit with many setbacks early on in the war as allied forces were forced into the Pusan perimeter for the first few months. Jesse and Tom's carrier, the USS Lady Gulf would immediately be ordered to reposition from their deployment in the Mediterranean to the Korean theater. It was sent back to Homeport and Quonset Point to replenish before sailing to the Western Pacific. It would take almost four months for Lady to find itself off the coast of Korea. On September 15th, almost three months after the commencement of hostilities, Allied forces landed at Incheon and the war began to take a drastic turn in the Allies' favor. For the next month and a half, the North Koreans were being pushed to the Chinese-Korean border. On October 11th, the Lady finally arrived off the coast of Korea and joined the U.S. Naval Fleet engaged in the operations in Korea, Task Force 77. Two other carriers, the USS Philippine Sea and the USS Valley Forge combined with Lady to provide naval air power over the whole theater. For three weeks, Naval air units supported the Allied land units pushing north. VF-32 flew a number of missions in their Corsairs, destroying North Korean ground targets. Jesse personally flew 11 combat missions by the end of October. On October 29th, with the Allied forces on the Korean-Chinese border, the carriers of Task Force 77 broke off towards Japan for rest and replenishment. With the Korean forces all but defeated, it seemed the war was about to end. Unknown to them, three Chinese infantry divisions had already snuck south across the border with another 24 divisions waiting north of the Yalu River, ready to cross. The Korean-Chinese border is separated by the Yalu River on the west and the Tumen River on the east. There were six major bridges to the northwest that crossed the river and five lesser ones to the northeast. Of main importance were the Highway Bridge and Railway Bridge at Sinwiju. These two bridges were built by Japan and designed to withstand airstrikes. Sinwiju had become the new capital of North Korea as Allied forces pushed north past Pongyang. Men and supplies were flowing south over the bridges at an alarming rate. On November 4th, General MacArthur, Supreme Allied Commander over Korea, directed a two-week maximum air effort to destroy the connections between Korea and China. In this directive, the Air Force was to bomb the Korean cities on the border with China, along with each bridge crossing China. Because each bridge was an international bridge and owned by both Korea and China, Allied units were only allowed to bomb the southern Korean half of each bridge. Air units were prohibited from crossing into Chinese airspace, which began halfway through the river. With these parameters, it was close to impossible for Air Force units to strike the bridges, specifically for the heavy bombers. All three naval carriers of Task Force 77, who were on liberty and rest in Japan, were immediately called up to help provide air support for the troops approaching the border. Halfway through their week of liberty ashore, the sailors and airmen of Task Force 77 were gathered up and hurriedly brought back to the ships of Sortie North. Jesse, with his friend Lee Nelson, were in a gift shop trying to buy a pearl necklace for his wife Daisy when Shore Patrol found them and exclaiming that all liberty had been canceled and they had to hurry back to the ship. All three carriers sortied and form up into Task Force 77. After several days of close air support, 
the Navy's mission changed. The first three missions by the Air Force to destroy the bridges at Sinwiju at their crossings failed as the B-29s could not hit them under the given parameters. They managed to burn the cities and approaches to the bridges, but they failed at knocking them out of service. The Air Force asked the Navy for assistance in bringing down the bridges as their strike craft would have an easier time at it. The Navy was assigned to destroy eight bridges located in four different cities. Each city contained a highway bridge and a railway bridge. Nanam, Hyacin, Manpo, and the most fortified place in Korea, Sinwiju. For the next two weeks, the Navy would make it their task to destroy these eight bridges on the Korean-Chinese border. The most important and most difficult targets were the bridges at Sinwiju, where the Navy would launch six separate strikes alone. Jesse and VF-32 would go on four of those strikes. We are going to take a detailed look at the final raid on these bridges that took place on November 18, 1950. This was a coordinated raid that consisted of six squadrons from two carriers of Task Force 77. The five strikes up to this point managed to damage the bridges and set fire to them. The highway bridge had a hole in it, and both bridges were damaged enough to halt traffic, but neither of them had fallen. The Chinese were repairing the bridges under darkness and would soon have them both up and operational again. The Navy needed to drop both bridges and make their destruction complete. To make things difficult, the North Koreans and Chinese had two weeks to adapt their defenses to the strikes. The Chinese in particular were taking advantage of the situation as they knew the Americans were not allowed to pass into Chinese airspace. They piled all their AA on their side of the river knowing they were safe as can be as the Allies were not allowed to strike them. Their MiGs learned early on that they could shoot at the vulnerable American aircraft and quickly dart back over to their airspace for protection. For the past two weeks, MiG-15s would take off at Antong Air Base and lazily climb up to 30,000 feet as the Americans approached the bridges. When the opportune time would approach, they would dive on the U.S. aircraft, strafing them, quickly turning back to China before any pursuit could occur. As one would expect, the frustration among the American pilots was mounting. To make matters worse, the bridges at Sinwiju were very difficult targets to hit. Up to that point in the Korean War, the Navy became skilled at knocking down bridges. They would line up and strike at lengthwise in order to increase chances of hitting it. However, on these bridges, due to the rules of engagement, only the first five spans were allowed to be targeted. U.S. aircraft were not allowed to cross the midpoint of the river to Chinese airspace. Thus, the strike path had to be somewhat perpendicular to the bridges a very hard target to hit, even for a skilled pilot. With these parameters, Task Force 77 came up with a plan for a coordinated strike on the bridges. After successfully dropping the bridges at Haiyan Sun the day before on November 17th, aircraft from the Leyte and Valley Forge would make one last strike on the bridges at Sinwiju. Let's take a look at the plan. There would be six squadrons participating, four squadrons of Carrier Air Wing 3 from Leyte and two squadrons from Carrier Air Wing 5 of Valley Forge. From Late A would be Fighting 31 with 12 Panthers. Fighting 32, Jesse and Tom's squadron, would have six Corsairs. Fighting 33, also with six Corsairs. And Attack Squadron 35 with 16 Sky Raiders. From Valley Forge would be Fighting 52 with 12 Panthers and Attack Squadron 55 with 16 Sky Raiders. There were three aspects for the strike package. Flak suppression, fighter coverage, and the main target, the two bridges. Due to the heavy AA, the Corsairs would go in first and destroy the heavy AA guns on the Korean side of the river. The Koreans had several batteries of 85mm heavy anti-aircraft guns. Then, Lady Sky Raiders would strike the highway bridge, followed up with Valley Forge's Sky Raiders striking the railway bridge. Air cover would be provided by Panthers from VF-31 and VF-52. Here, we will see the difficulties operating first-generation jets in the Navy. Jets, although efficient fighters at the time, had many drawbacks when operating with prop aircraft. Aside from range and payload deficiencies, the F-9F Panther's cruising speed was far faster than the props. With only around 200 miles per hour for the Corsair and Sky Raider, the Panthers' cruising speed was more than double that at 480 miles per hour. Being that the target was roughly 250 miles away, this gave the Panthers only 20 minutes for tactical use after traveling there and back. 
This meant the Panthers could only stay with the strike aircraft for a relatively small amount of time. To provide proper cover for the strike packets towards the target, over the target, and back from the target, much coordination had to take place. The mission tactical schedule would be as follows. The props from the strike package would launch from Leyte and head towards the target. Approximately 50 minutes later, eight Panthers from Fighting 31 would launch from Leyte and fly towards the target. They would meet up with the strike package and provide cover for the last 10 minutes towards the target and 20 minutes over the target. This unit was called the Target Combat Air Patrol, or TARCAP for short. After those 20 minutes, they would be bingo fuel and had to head directly back to the carrier, unable to provide any cover for the strike group on their return journey. To fill this gap in air cover, a second flight of four Panthers from Fighting 31 would launch 15 minutes after the TARCAP meet up over the EVAC rally point and protect the strike package for most of the return journey. Since this strike consisted of squadrons from two carriers, Fighting 52 of Valley Forge would do the same setup for its squadron of Sky Raiders. Now we will go into detail about Brown and Hunter's assignments for the mission. In this we will notice several differences from what happened in the movie to what actually took place. For starters, Doug Neal was the skipper of Fighting 32 not Dick Savoli. Savoli was his second-in-command and flight leader for Hudner, Brown, and Koenig. The movie needed to morph these two characters into one due to time limitations for character development. In the briefing room, the skipper briefed the men of Fighting 32 on their mission. The map of the city had three circles on it, each representing a battery of Soviet-built 85mm AA cannons. A pair of Corsairs would be assigned to each target. The skipper, Commander Doug Neal, would lead the flight and strike the first battery. His wingman was Ensign Stevens. Lieutenant Commander Dick Savoli and his wingman, Lieutenant Tom Hunter, would strike the second battery. This would be followed by Ensign Jesse Brown and his wingman, Ensign Bill Koenig, who were assigned the third battery. They would fly into the target area at 20,000 feet, dive on the target and drop their 1,000-pound bomb and immediately evac the area. Their egress route was the river. They were to fly low and fast as they followed the river to the Yellow Sea a few miles from their location. From there, they would join up with the squadron and head back to the carrier. Again, another area where things differ from the movie and what historically happened, Jesse was not one to disobey orders like he did in the movie. In fact, Jesse was meticulous about getting the mission right. He went up to the map on the wall after the briefing and pulled out his notebook to sketch a detailed map of his target and the city. He knew there would be chaos and confusion during the mission and he was determined to place his bomb exactly where it was supposed to go. After the briefing, Ensign Koenig was granted for having flu symptoms. His spot was filled with a mission standby pilot, Ensign Bill Wilkerson, or Wilkie for short. Wilkie, worried he didn't know the target, bomb line, or approach sector, was quickly comforted as Jesse put his hand on his shoulder and said, You're with me. Just drop when I drop, and you'll do just fine. So with a detailed strike plan in motion and a highly restricted rules of engagement in place, we are ready to move on to the mission. On the morning of the 18th, aircraft began being spotted for launch. With the pilots of Fighting 32 in their aircraft waiting for takeoff, Jesse, being a devout Christian, was doing his pre-flight ritual of praying for himself and his squadron mates. After a month of combat operations, the flight deck crew stopped asking questions as to why Jesse would always duck away in this cockpit before takeoff. With the Corsairs lifting off from the deck, the Sky Raiders were beginning to be spotted on the deck behind them. As the strike package was forming up, Hunter noticed a problem with his flight leader, Commander Savoli. He was having hydraulic problems which caused his gear and flaps not able to retract. The skipper told Savoli to abort the mission and for Hunter to form up on him. Originally depending on Savoli on when to drop his bomb, now Hunter had to make sure he successfully took out their assigned AA battery all on his own. Again, here's another area the movie stepped away from what historically happened. In the movie, Savoli accurately had the hydraulic problem and was forced to retire. However, the movie made Savoli the skipper and implied that Hunter was to take command of the entire raid, not just the squadron. This could not be further from the truth, as the skipper, Commander Neal, was still on the mission in command of Fighting 32. 
He also was not in command of the entire strike force, as each squadron commander led their own aircraft on the mission. So, in real life, Hunter did not take command of the entire raid, or even just the squadron. The only difference Savoli's departure made was that Hunter was solely responsible for taking out the second AA battery. After the entire strike package formed up from both carriers, the formation began their transit towards the target. As planned 50 minutes later, Lady Starcap of 8 Panthers from Fighting 31 took off from the carrier. 10 minutes later, Valley Forge's Tarkap of 8 Panthers from Fighting 31 took off from their carrier. Fifteen minutes later, both carriers launched the remaining Panthers to provide cover on the way home. With precision timing, the Panthers met up with the strike package. Every squadron commander and every pilot went through their checklist one last time. As they made their approach, Sinuiju and the Yalu bridges came into sight. The skipper radioed, prepare for attack and all of Fighting 32 started going through their attack procedures. Thick flak began to form in the sky, however it was not targeting the Corsairs. The flak was forming 6,000 feet below them, targeting the flight path of the Sky Raiders. Free from flak right now, the Corsairs would have to dive through the flak to hit their targets. The skipper gave out the command to deploy brakes. Unlike dive bombers, the Corsair did not have traditional air brakes for bombing. The landing gear had a setting to act as dive brakes and stabilize the Corsair as they dived on the target. With everything in place, the battle begins. Geared down, Fighting 32 began to position themselves over their targets. One by one, the Corsairs turned over to begin their dive. Tension grew as they prepared to fly through the flat cloud below them. Each pilot timed up and focused on their dive as flak began to explode all around them. Before they knew it, they were through the flat cloud unharmed. Surprisingly, small caliber AA began to fly towards them. Just then, Fighting 33 began their dives right behind 32's Corsairs. The skipper and his wingman were first to drop their bombs. Immediately, they pulled up, dodged AA fire from every direction. They rushed towards the river to make their evac. Tom saw direct hits from the skipper, but quickly focused his attention on his target. He began firing his machine guns and dropped at the last second just as he pulled hard to avoid hitting the ground. Another successful hit and target destroyed. Jesse and Wilkie were on the last part of their dive when Wilkie still could not spot the target. He glanced over his wingman and noticed Jesse, focused, unmoved by incoming AA below. Just as Jesse began to fire his tracers, Wilkie saw a school filled with children but no target. Jesse released his bomb, but Wilkie refrained, still not seeing the target. He was afraid of hitting the school and children. Jesse's bomb hit right on the money and destroyed the AA battery while missing the school. Jesse and Wilkie dodged tracers from every direction as they hugged the ground and made their way towards the river. Fighting 33 began their drops and successfully destroyed their AA units. As the Corsairs began their evac, the Sky Raiders were preparing for their dive. The flak began to dissipate as each heavy anti-aircraft battery was silenced one at a time by the Corsairs. Just then, a Sky Raider pilot frantically yelled out, 11 o'clock high. 14 contrails were spotted at 30,000 feet, approaching from the Chinese side of the Yalu. 
Commander George Simmons, CO Fighting 31, promptly radioed his Tarkap. Tally ho! Let's take him, boys. The eight Panthers charged head on through the formation of 14 MiG 15s. An ensuing melee between fighter jets began to fill the sky. Although outmatched by the MiG-15 in most categories, the F-9F Panther was able to outturn the MiG. Combined with superior training and squadron tactics, the Panthers were able to hold their own. Ensign Frederick Weber was able to cut inside the MiG-15 flown by Senior Lieutenant Arkady Tarshinov. Tarshinov, who was abandoned by his wingman, tried to evade the young Ensign, but Weber maintained his position behind his MiG. Tarshinov pulled up sharply, and Weber was able to place his 20mm on the MiG. The MiG quickly dove, then straightened out. Weber was able to finish him off as the MiG plummeted into the Yalu. Tom Hunter was over the Yellow Sea, forming up with his squadron as he watched in the distance the fighting taking place over Sinwiju. He had a front row seat to the action. Above him, four Panthers from VF-31 protected the gathering planes of Late Day's strike group. Once they finished gathering, they would make their way back home under the protection of those four Panthers. As jets fought it out at high altitudes over Sinwiju, Lady Sky Raiders began their dive bombing run on the highway bridge. One at a time, the pilots of Attack Squadron 35 released their bombs. The first several were near misses as columns of water shot up around the bridge. Eventually, one made a direct hit on the fifth span and it began to drop into the water. The remaining Sky Raiders repositioned to the spans closer to the Korean shore. Several more impacts were made on the bridge. After the planes and smoke cleared, three spans of the highway bridge had fallen into the water. This photo was taken just after VA-35's bomb run. You can see the three spans that had successfully fallen, as well as the spread of their bomb impacts. Several misses in the water, along with the smoke from several misses on land. As the Sky Raiders of VA-35 made their egress via the Yalu River, the dogfighting 30,000 feet above them was continuing on. The 13 remaining MiG-15s were using their craft's higher speed to outpace the Panthers, but superior squadron tactics and turn rate kept the eight jets of Fighting 31 in the game. Another MiG was abandoned by their wingman and flight leader of the second flight, Lieutenant Davidson, was able to turn into him and score several hits on his fuselage. Smoking, it began to run back across the Chinese airspace. Spooked by such an aggressive defense, the remaining MiGs returned across the Yala without inflicting any damage on Lady Strike Force. Fighting 31, proud of their accomplishments, were low on fuel and immediately turned to head back to the Lady. On their way back, they passed the formation of Valley Forge's aircraft heading for Sinwiju. Attack Squadron 55 was preparing their Sky Raiders for their dive on the rail bridge while Fighting 52's Tarkap of 8 Panthers were providing cover 10,000 feet above them. Over the Yellow Sea, Lady Strike Group was finishing forming up and preparing for the return flight back to the Lady. With almost no flak in the air impeding the Sky Raiders, VA-55 pilots began to get into position for their dive run. Just then, a MiG-15 made a dive at one of the Sky Raiders. Firing a volley of 20mm bullets, it immediately turned back to safety over the Yalu before it could be intercepted. After the failed encounter with Fighting 31's Tarkap, the MiGs reverted back to their tactics of single dive runs followed by retreat to safety. The only thing the Panthers could do was to take quick shots at the diving MiGs in hopes of diverting their dive on the Sky Raiders. At 200 miles per hour faster than the Panthers, there was not much the frustrated pilots of VA-52 could do to the MiGs. VA-52 CO, Commander William Lamb, positioned his Tarkat between the MiGs and Sky Raiders as best he could to intercept. The Sky Raiders began making their dives on the rail bridge. One by one, they deployed their air brakes and dove on the bridge. Explosions of near misses racked the bridge as they released their bombs. As one MiG-15 dove on the Sky Raiders, Commander Lamb, along with Lieutenant Robert Parker, fired on it. Sky Raider pilots saw the MiG break up and crash into the ground. 
After the planes of VA-55 finished their run, only one bomb scored a direct hit. It managed to set the rail bridge on fire, but failed to bring it down. With the mission over, the remaining planes of Task Force 77 Strike Force made their return home. When all was said and done, November 18th strike on the Yalu bridges was a success. After five previous strikes on these bridges, the Navy was finally able to bring down the highway bridge. Among stiff anti-air defenses and enemy MiGs, every pilot of Task Force 77 strike made it back home safely. A true credit to the skill and grit of the naval aviators of Task Force 77. After two weeks, with 12 strike missions, the Navy was able to destroy four of the eight assigned bridges over the Yalu. Unfortunately, reconnaissance discovered another four pontoon bridges were recently built across the Yalu, and more importantly, portions of the Yalu were already freezing over. Soon, the entire Yalu would be frozen, which would allow everything from men and tanks to safely cross wherever they pleased. This capability would remain for the next four months of winter. The combined Navy and Air Force attacks had severed nearly half the bridges into China and damaged most of the others. As November progressed, it was becoming increasingly evident that the returns were not equal to the effort being expanded against these targets. As the carriers departed for replenishment on the 19th, orders were given to end strikes on the Yalu bridges and focus back on air support for ground forces. What was unknown to the Allies was that Chinese forces were already in Korea in great strength before the missions to destroy the Yalu bridges were even assigned. Very soon, the Korean War was about to take a drastic change as the Chinese would launch their assault on Allied forces. This, however, is a topic for another video. In terms of comparing the movie Devotion's depiction of the Yalu raid with what actually took place, yes, many things were inaccurate. However, such is the case of trying to tell the story of complex military engagements over the big screen. There is a reason there are very few aviation movies depicting large raids. Such stories are hard to tell through the limited time and restrictions of a movie. To include all this in Devotion could have easily added another 30 minutes or more to an already long movie. Imagine squeezing the Band of Brothers series into one movie, or the naval engagement in the movie Midway to a 5 minute scene. So let's celebrate this movie and encourage Hollywood to continue to make movies that shine light on the heroic men of the armed forces who sacrifice so much for the sake of others. Now, if you enjoyed the movie and want more, I challenge you to get the book Devotion. This is where I have the means for you to receive the audiobook version for free. Audible gives you a month free once you sign up with them. You can cancel your membership before that month ends and not have to pay anything. Don't worry, Amazon gladly gives out that month free to try to win over anyone with their service. So don't worry about canceling before your trial ends and don't miss out on getting this book free. If you're anything like me, you will listen to Devotion before the week's end. Use the link below to get started on your trial. And if you have already read Devotion, try this book, The Flight of Jesse Leroy Brown by Theodore Taylor. Another great book about Jesse that goes into depth in areas that Devotion misses. The movie Devotion is a great movie, and we should end this with honoring these two men, Jesse Leroy Brown and Tom Jerome Hudner.